Hi, I'm Betty McClellan, and this is the third in a series of interviews with Pauline Woodbridge relating to domestic and family violence in Australia. Pauline, I'm sure you've read Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General David Morrison's excellent address on White Ribbon Day 2014. He made some very important points about the need for men to take responsibility and to be held accountable for their violent behaviour toward women. Now, seeing as we're focusing in this interview on legal responses, among other things, I want to quote a sentence from David Morrison's address and ask you to comment. He said, The matter of violence against women in our national legislation reflects an approach that appears random and reactive rather than reasoned and principled. Another very significant person putting domestic violence in the public agenda. We're in a very interesting time to see these things that we've been, you know, we've been talking about through this interview. And I think he's put his finger on the on the pulse with this one, is that it is He's talking about the national agenda, but around the states and in individuals, the way we respond to perpetrators of violence or to the experience of violence for the victims of the violence has been very depending very much on people's beliefs and attitudes and you know what they feel that they can do or how they understand the violence. So that's certainly true and that is an issue that um, when we talk about the violence against women being preventable, it's about sorting out those things, um, tidying up, closing the gaps, making sure that we don't have unintended outcomes from legislation that we might put in place, um, finding ways that are actually going to work. And the best way to do that is to be hearing from victims about what their experience was like and um, being guided by that to, to straighten out the issues. In, um, one of the things that we have been doing is having inter uh, integrated approaches to domestic violence where you bring stakeholders and groups of people within systems together so that we can look at what the issues are, close those gaps, sort out the best solutions um, at a local level. And so we certainly need that uh, approach at both the state and the federal level. I think he was spot on when he said that. Yes. Okay, now can you take us back, Paul, into the 1970s and give us a brief rundown on the federal legislation enacted by Australia's various governments? Well, the 1970s, of course, was a time of great women's activism. It was a time where women were really coming out and saying the condition of women in post-war Australia in a time of prosperity where women were uh, wanting to end, enter the workforce, where women were wanting um, a stop to things like violence against women, where women wanted to be able to work, walk the streets safely without the fear of rape, sexual assault. It was a time of great activism. And that activism led to a lot of things occurring. But I think at that time, government policy was really lagging behind. But one thing that did come out in the 1970s, of course, was the family law changes. And that was where Australia ended up with no-fault divorces. And that, again, was a time of great chaos and protest and action and activism because um, the more conservative parts of Australian society were just saying that we can't have that, that um, it would actually take away some of men's rights that if women had no-fault divorces and that we would, it would be the end of the Australian family. It was predicting the end of uh, life as we know it at that time. Yeah. And what about Queensland, Pauline, this state that we live in? Um, talk a bit about the various task forces and inquiries held by uh, our state government and the legislation enacted over the years. Well, it was after the 70s when there was so much activism that gradually um, government policy did start to catch up and um, in other states particularly there were um, funding started to, to roll because um, a lot of unfunded women's shelters, for example, were now in place and they were clearly being seen as being needed. They were developing stats and they were able to lobby governments and so um, policy did catch up and money started to flow. And here in Queensland that occurred as well. And so in, um, in the late 1980s, we had a Queensland Domestic Violence Task Force. 
And it was an interesting uh, task force because of our large Indigenous population here in Queensland, in North Queensland. So we, um, it was also the time of the Black Deaths in custody. And so Aboriginal women did not want their, their, their abusers, their husbands and partners and sons and so on, who were using domestic violence against them, to face criminal charges and to be jailed because of the Black, black Deaths in custody problem that was being experienced at that time. And so the Queensland Task Force really came up with an alternate way of dealing with domestic violence. So I can um, talk about that as well, but the, um, the other thing that the Queensland Task Force did that was different from the other states and territories was that it quantified the cost of domestic violence and that was the first attempt to do that. And I think when those figures came out they were pretty shocking at the time. I mean, the moment we talk about the costs of domestic violence for Australia being 15.1 billion per year, which is an, you know, an astonishing cost, a very hidden cost too, and most people don't understand that. So the Queensland Task Force was one of the first attempts to try and look at what this costs the community to have violence against women continuing. But of course the women activists knew that the cost was borne by the women victims mm -hmm. and by their children and so they stayed very active around this time. So we ended up with the domestic violence legislation of 1989 here in Queensland as a way to respond to domestic violence that provided safety to the victims but didn't necessarily hold the perpetrators accountable but certainly fitted with for the Aboriginal women to get some protection without the flow on of their partners being jailed because like many other countries we have a, a very high imprisonment rate of our Indigenous population compared to the mainstream population. So that was the sort of politics that was um, act, being enacted at that time. But last year we also, Queensland set out on another domestic violence task force and that has been operational as we speak and we're still and we're expecting very shortly for the results of that to come out and I think the activists of today are really hopeful that, that any new proposals for new legislations that might come out of the current task force are going to be still very strong on holding victims safe um, trying to stop the violence which is a vital part of the work but also holding perpetrators accountable um, streaming perpetrators into a range of programs that teach them, educate them and insist that they change their behaviours and um, uh, very much um, work at both sides of the, of the equation. So it's not only what we've done for the last, uh, since the 80s, is, is to just pr try to protect the, the victims, but certainly to try and not only uh, challenge the the abusers or the men that are using the violence in their family relationships change their behaviours and make uh, families safe. Make women feel like I can risk forming a relationship with a man because you know if he does use domestic violence it's going to get nipped in the bud very quickly like uh, we were talking before about it won't be random it'll be really you know something that is going to happen and that um, that the police will be very active, the courts will be very active and everyone will work together towards saying that violence is not tolerated. Violence against women is absolutely preventable and here in Queensland we're working very hard to ensure that no more women are killed and that women and children are not hurt. Now Pauline, I'm interested to move on from this discussion of parliamentary and legal responses to look at feminist responses to men's violence against women. How has the feminist movement responded? Um, I'd like you to comment here on both the analysis undertaken by feminists over the years and the practice, uh, the practical responses to the phenomenon of domestic violence. Well, Betty, the feminist analysis and the practice are really interlinked. One really doesn't make a lot of sense without the other. So, you know, the activism, I suppose, of the earlier times we talked about were raising awareness, were making demands, were putting domestic violence and violence against women on the public agenda. And so as when money flowed and services were set up, the feminist practice was the ideal way to respond to the women who were victims of violence and to have a really good analysis of why 
perpetrators are doing what they're doing and about the best way to stop them. So from a feminist point of view, um, domestic violence is situated within the society that we live. The way that men are socialised and the way that women are socialised into an unequal power structure. And we still have remnants of that unequal power structure around us today. And so we still have domestic violence, but we have made some inroads. But it is thanks to the feminist work and the feminist analysis that we've got any decent understanding about what's going on. And the feminists are the one that lead and who are out in front to try and help the mainstream, the, the ordinary population, the ordinary people in our society, but the mainstream responders as well to understand what domestic violence is all about. So we're really working very hard to help people understand that it's not about a poor man who had a poor upbringing. Lots of people have poor upbringings, live in poverty, have experienced trauma in their lives or really, you know, lost parents and it was traumatic for them and so on. But that doesn't mean that they turn around and start to become abusing other people. We need to look at um, what the effects of the socialisation of men, how it leads to them actually using domestic violence. Not all men do, of course, that's we're not trying to say that, but that propensity and that high use of violence um, by men over the women in their lives is a particular behaviour in most of the societies around the world, but we have really good analysis about it here in Australia, I think, and we're working very actively to um, educate others and to help people understand the analysis. So some of the therapeutic analysis, some of the excusing al analysis, such as it's because of alcohol or poverty or those sorts of ideas, they're really losing favour now. There's a far more active understanding that it is about the inner inequality between men, men and women in our society and the, uh, the action all around the world and in fact the United Nations is about to do their 20 years on from the platform of action that was put in place in Beijing 20 years ago to uh, increase the equality for women and girls right across the globe um, means that here in Australia we've got a very clear idea that it is about still closing the gaps of inequality between men and women and that that will actually be the secret to stopping the vast amount of domestic violence. So on the, there is a continuum where there will be some men who just never learn any other way to deal with things but use violence. But that violence is probably going to be in a lot of arenas, not just in their home but you know in public and amongst their other relationships because most abusers in domestic violence are uh, perfectly functional and decent people in all their other relationships except their relationship in the home. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a far better analysis and understanding of that now and we're all working very um, strongly to make sure that that doesn't slip into mainstream ideas about, you know, well women are getting too strident now or women are demanding their rights or uh, it's men are disadvantaged in current society because women are so strong. Uh, we've still got gender pay gaps, for example. There's a whole range of ways that we can still demonstrate the inequality between men and women in Australian society. But those uh, structural things are only uh, indications of the beliefs that we still hold in Australian society. Beliefs that men are socialised to hold that they are the providers, that they're the breadwinners, that they're the primary person, that it's the way they look at life that's important, it's um, that they've got a right to dictate uh, you know, how, how life is lived or how a relationship is, is run. And so the hardest work of all for feminists and for um, any uh, people responding to this, especially the women victims who are desperately trying to reconstruct their abuser into somebody that they can live with safely before their children are too damaged. Um, to tackle those beliefs and uh, attitudes that are held by the perpetrators is the hardest part, but it's almost, in some ways, like almost the last bastion before we reach our goal of stopping violence against women, is to challenge all of those attitudes and beliefs to make sure that the systems work properly 
that uh, perpetrators are held accountable and that women and children can be safe. Well, I think that's a good place to stop for now, Pauline. That was such a good answer um, about the feminist response. Um, so strong, so thank you for that. Now, in our next interview, we'll focus on the history and day-to-day uh, -day operation of the North Queensland um, Domestic Violence Resource Service, managed and coordinated by Pauline since its, since its establishment in 1994. So, hope you'll join us then.